Thank you. Thank you for coming. And uh, what a pleasure to get to be here and to, uh, with Percival and to get to do some close listening to Schoenberg's Opus 19. Um, I, in lieu of, I mean, the introduction, if you need biographical information, it's all in the pamphlet. It's silly to yeah. be repeating the bios all the time. Um, I wanted to, uh, let me just say something about what the, what the structure of what we're going to do. Um, we're going to listen to the, the entirety of the Opus 19, which is pretty, fairly short, six minutes, seven minutes altogether. And then we may focus in on the second movement uh, and listen to this a, a couple of times in a row. Um, and we'll talk our way through it and around it and, uh, and probably about all kinds of other things. I don't know where we'll go in our conversation. No, we don't know where we're going. So, um, but I did want to say this. I wanted to start off with, I was just reading, in kind of preparation for this, I was reading um, Percival's novel, Telephone, which I hadn't read before. And in it, the main character, Zach Wells, is a geologist. And there's a scene that just made me laugh out loud where, um, where Zach is driving with his daughter, Sarah, who begins fiddling with the radio. And uh, the passage that, that, I was, that I wanted to cite here was, uh, it says, um, she fiddled with the radio, complained about the music of her generation, ridiculed the music of mine, and settled on the classical station. I hate Vivaldi, she said. Everyone hates Vivaldi, but no one will admit it. Right? <laughs> and, which is true, right? I mean, I'm a musicologist, I'll tell you it's true. Everyone does hate Vivaldi and no one will admit it. One of the things about Schirmer, I was trying to, I was thinking about that line and kind of playing with it in my head and I was thinking, you know, you could say, I guess, everyone hates Schoenberg and everyone will admit it or something like that. But that's not, but that's, I don't, but what I was thinking about really was the idea that everyone hates Schoenberg but somehow nobody's actually listened to Schoenberg. That seems to me more the case that he's a composer who, uh, who suffers from a kind of prejudice against his music because of bad music appreciation teachers, bad music history teachers, uh, or a general kind of um, unwillingness for people to sit with music that doesn't always immediately please them. So I thought it was, when I found out that, um, when I was asked to participate in this and found out that Percival wanted to talk about the six little piano pieces, I was delighted because I think it's just an absolutely marvelous piece of music, like so much of Schoenberg's music. Undoubtedly marvelous, and it'll be a real pleasure to get to spend some time listening to it. Great. So, should we play? Oh, so we'll play the yeah. whole thing, and then, and then we'll talk. All right. Okay. So we're gonna. The performance here is the Paul Jacobs recording, from I think from the 1970s. Marvelous recording.
I mean, amazing, incredible piece, you know, uh, these, these six little piano pieces written around 1911, 1912, 1913. You know, who's writing music like this at that moment? Who's written music like this since, you know? Yeah. Um, I guess the question to begin with um, would be, well, let me ask you, when did you first hear this piece? I was afraid you were going to ask me that. Um, <laughs> I, th I think I was around 13 or 14 yeah. when I heard it, and it was just I mean, lacking any, not that I have any sophistication now, but certainly lacking any then. It was just uh, bizarre. And, and, and the first time I heard it, it was just strange and but not like I I, I heard a, before hearing this one I I I um I'd heard Velocte Narc uh -huh. and 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 it's really beautiful and then to hear this after that um was jarring um but it wasn't until much later that I returned to it um but it never left me. That, that was the kind of the, the lesson I, I got from it was it made an impression on me even though I, I pretty much abandoned it as soon as I, I heard it. Mm -hmm. um, then when I was, I think pretty much when I, I was a painter before I started writing, but when I started um, painting, I listened to it again. But at that time, I listened to it over and over and it, it it revealed itself to me and, um, and became one of my favorite works. Um, and then, I won't say it's because of this that I, I, I started writing, but I think it informed my understanding of what I wanted to do was looking for an, another language um, to make not just my art, but to, for the making of um, fiction. Um, and then as I read more about Schoenberg, um, what's impressive is he's not looking for another language because he doesn't like the one he has. Um, in fact, I think it's fueled by the fact that he does love um, uh, tonal, for lack of a better word, music. And this move to the atonal was um, a, a way to advance our understanding of tonality. Um, this, I guess, would be a related question. I'm wondering why, of all the things that you could decide to talk about here, right, carte blanche, why this piece? Um, okay, and everything comes back to language to me. And, and by language, I mean something more expansive than just what we speak, um, what we produce. And when I think of... of, um, of Western music, one of the things that occurs to me, and, and I'm going to get his name wrong, and it's is it Schechner, the, uh, the, 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 the music theory that's taught to everyone. Oh, it's Schenker. Schenker, yes. Yeah. And, and, and there's a, um, uh, that's troubling, the whole Schenker thing, because mm -hmm. embedded in this devotion to 18th century melodic Western music is is this white supremacy. Mm -hmm. um, um, he, he even uses that language in the in his text. Um, and there's a and there but there's such a devotion to him in in, in, in Western music schools that it's, it's it's I wouldn't say it's irritating, but it's alarming in a, in a very quiet way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, and so. I, as I was thinking about that, I wonder um, about Schoenberg and, and, the, and I wondered if, if part of his, and this could be just completely wrong, but living in, in um, early 20th century Germany, um, I, I wondered if his search, and a lot of people felt that, um, that chromaticism had been 
um, used up um, with Wagner and, and, and Mahler. And so it wasn't, a, Stravinsky went a different way than Schoenberg, but I wondered if it was in him that he felt that music was anti-Semitic, that, that that melodic, um, that chromaticism it was excluding him. Mm. And so I wondered if that search, that desire to find another language, um, uh, and, and one that necessarily democratizes um, um, notes by removing uh, a, a privileged tonal center was, mm -hmm. was important. And I say this at, apologizing to the fact that I have no expertise in this. This is all um, just a, um, cowboy talk when it comes <laughs> up to me. But, um, um, could you, I wonder if you could say more about um, Schoenberg and language, right? I mean, there's always a, there's a, we were talking a little bit about this earlier. There's always the trope, right, that music as being a kind of universal language, right, which is nonsense. I mean, every culture has music, but the, the specificity of music is always, is, is always incredibly culturally specific. Yeah. Right? Um, so I wonder how you think about, but there is something language-like about music, right? And so I wonder if you have thoughts or ideas about what, I mean, what kind of language is Schoenberg getting at or trying to create here or leaving behind? Well, again, I, I don't think it's, it, it, it really, he, I mean, he's, for most of it, he wrote a, a book on, t on, on harmony. Right. He, so it's, it's not that he was running from um, harmony, as, as I really believe trying to add to our understanding of it by, for lack of a better word, corrupting it. Mm -hmm. um, or in some way making it more honest or ethical even. Um, to employ a word that can only get me into trouble. Um, um, but as we were talking about language earlier, um, I have this love of nonsense. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you, you, even, I mean, we can be even more specific, Victorian nonsense, uh, Lewis Carroll, uh, Edward Lear, and, and what I love about, and I employ it often in my work, what I love about nonsense is that it has to adhere more rigidly to syntax and, and to how we understand the rules of language than sense does. Um, that's how it that's how it works. It makes us believe that it's going to mean something. And then it doesn't mean anything. But because we wanted to believe it, there's some meaning to it. And I, and I love that. But just beyond that, um, if, it takes a lot to make the nonsense. But if you push it too far, it becomes gibberish. And... Um, and it doesn't trick us in that way. We don't start thinking, oh, yeah, I, I think I know what this can mean. Um, and, and so in music, that, that line is, is amazing. He's playing with our expectations about, about you know, resolution of, of, of chords, what we expect to hear. Mm -hmm. um, the reason that music is comfortable for us sometimes, the way the, the very reason that Baroque music drives me crazy mm -hmm. is it's just so predictable. And, and, and it's not that it's ugly, it's beautiful music, but it irritates me because it is predictable. Mm -hmm. And, and it, again, it's not the music, it's, it's, it's that I don't like that I have been enculturated to expect something. Mm -hmm. There's, um, I mean, some of the, the people who are, you know, the musicologists and theorists and stuff who tend to work on Schoenberg think of, often describe what he's doing as a kind of imminent development of musical material, you know, working through tonal music, through chromaticism, and just kind of a, it's as if it's a kind of continual, like, burrowing down into what music could be or might be. So we, you keep shedding on somehow the inessentials or something. Tonality could be inessential. Conventions could be inessential. And yeah. what emerges is something that is developmental and motivic and 
and loose but organized and but and coherent and incoherent at the same time. You know, it's like, I mean a kind of nonsense, right? I think that's true of these pieces, but when we get but later on, uh -huh. when he, in, he imposes the rules of surrealism, and, and we tie it to Schoenberg's credit, he never said that these were hard, fast rules that anyone should follow. He, um, um, all those rules about creating that uh, new language for music, mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm going to change suggestions, I think do point to what you're saying mm -hmm. about, um, about where he thinks this is, is leading. But I, but, I, but I also wonder if, if um, if um, it creates a music after the fact. Um, and sometimes I, I think we always think of music as being something the composer hears in her or his head, mm -hmm. and then you're trying to recreate that thing in the world. Um, and, and sometimes, and this is what I have to resist and actually what I like about mm -hmm. um, again, so-called atonal music is that sometimes the music is created, then, then seen, and then heard after. Mm. And, and I'm kind of moved by, by that. There's, um, um, there's this, uh, Theodore Adorno, you know, who's one of the great writers about Schoenberg, in, has a line, I was just looking at it earlier today, in the philosophy of modern music, where he is describing kind of Schoenberg's music from this period. And, and I think, I mean, this is a paraphrase. I'm, I'm, I'm an idiot to try to paraphrase Adorno, right? <laughs> yeah. um, but he's basically talking about how this is a music that, um, where, note, where each note kind of seeks its next note. Um, it's not a music that's got a set of conventional top-down rules. It's as if the, each inscription on the page is demanding some thing to follow. Then Schoenberg is sort of following along that path. You know, he's being led along mm -hmm. um, without you know, a kind of clear vision of compositional intent behind it, but as a kind of, but this is, would also be the moment where like the, the, some imminent logic that's in the notes and in their construction is coming forth. Well, I kind of like that, um, but I don't do as many drugs as Adorno. <laughs> <laughs> so so, so I, I'm not sure I understand. <laughs> we could, I mean, maybe one way to try to, um, we could try to pin some of these ideas down a little bit by, by focusing yeah, on, on the second. Yeah, yeah okay. should we do that? Yeah. All right, so, so we have the score up here. If you want to look at a score, if you don't want to look at a score, don't worry about it. We have our, we're being pretentious here. We have our scores on our yeah. lap. You have the nice edition. I have a really old one. I got the old <laughs> one. I have this cheap one with a Renoir painting on the front of it, which seems kind of badass. I like these, I always imagine these two girls playing Schoenberg's six little <laughs> piano pieces here, <laughs> right? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, okay. So we'll focus on here on the second. So we'll play it a couple of times, and then we'll yeah. we can yeah, talk about good. what we're hearing, and we'll play it some more. All right. So here we go.
Moses said after you listen to it a second time, there's um, that chord that you know, the, with the, the, the low notes mm-hmm. is so satisfying. <laughs> it, it, it really is. Uh, um, and what I don't like about me uh-huh. is that as I, I hear it, and this is what it's not fair to Schoenberg, and this, I try to get into the spirit of it. I'm, I'm imagining that he doesn't want me to see that G and B together, the, the, that, um, the third. Mm-hmm. And then that fifth comes in, so you get that tritone. So you, all of a sudden, I'm thinking in tonality. And, and I, so I try not to. Um, and then I think that he's done this to me, and I think that's great. You see, he's, the, the music has worked on me to make me um, sort of look at myself, and I, and I think that's part of what he's, what he's doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, um, I, the opening is so, I mean, this is, it's so remarkable, right? To, we're, the, you know, looking at these first two bars of music, which could easily be in G major, right? yeah. Um, you know, by bar three, where that melody in the right hand starts to descend all the way down to that A flat, it's in that bar for me where, like, where I mean, Schoenberg has clearly given us something that is like he's given us the the kind of desire for it to be tonal, right? And he's also taken it away by the time you get to measure three, right? This incredible, to be, and amazing to be able to do that in three bars of music. Three bars of music, and then, and then he, he does that, that thing with, where he introduces uh, the F sharp, A, C, and E, mm-hmm. and, and, and gives us that, is it a diminished seven? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, uh, I, it's, Dentists make me mad because it's really manipulative. <laughs> but he's, I just feel like, yeah, this is when you're in a room with somebody who's a lot smarter than you are. And it's, and but, all, that's right, but all music is manipulative, yeah, right? That's, I mean, that's, this is, that's exactly right. This, yeah. is the, this is music as an yeah, art of time. It's yeah. an art of manipulation, you know? I think the, I mean, I'm, there's something so uh, courageous, I think, about the end of that end of bar three. Like, um, well, actually, I just play three bars in, yeah, you know? Yeah, I mean, um, this move is so courageous. Um, also, what is this weird little staccato dance? In I, I G don't major, know. Because right? all it says is slowly. In the <laughs> that note, right? Yeah, so that I mean, that's, that's a moment of, of that is a dialectic right there. That is a moment yeah. of, of contradiction and negation. You know, something is being offered up and taken away simultaneously at that moment. And once you, for me, on the you know, second or third hearing of it, then I, I, if you were to take that note out, that would be an experiment. I would mm-hmm. just remove that, that note. It would, it, it, would, it would sound like a vacuum. Yeah. yeah. I sometimes, I mean, this, is this going to get too nerdy? I sometimes imagine what that note would be like if it were a G. If, we're to go, oh, if the whole we melody were to, to the just the land on the tonic again, you could close the whole thing off, you know? It's just this one half step away from being, a comp- from offering you the most standard kind of mo- movement between consonants to dissonance back to, to a kind of closed tonic chord again, you know? Yeah, I that would be weird. It turns out it's actually oh, bl- I die, oh, bl- I die or something. <laughs> 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 the, uh, what, uh, should we, the, I mean, the, so once, we kind of have to give up on our tonal expectations early in this, right? It offers it to you, it takes it away. It never, it's still a specter that hangs out over the whole movement in a way. And it's aware of it, and, that, mm-hmm. and, that's, and that's the real beauty of it. And it's aware that we're looking for it. And in, in writing this, um, that's really what keeps me going is being able to exploit the expectations of, mm-hmm. of, of a reader inside. It's really instructive for me to, to to hear this. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, we were, we're talking, I mean, I think when we were first, on our, we had a couple of Zoom calls before this, to yeah. kind of, and we were talking a little bit about, um, about parody and irony, right? You know, we were oh, talking, yeah. right? 
you know, and the idea that you that like for things to be parodic or ironic, you need a kind of convention or you need something underneath it, right? You need a, in the the mind of the reader or the mind of the listener needs yeah. something pre-existing, right, to see how things have been deformed or made or you know how they've been um, uh, troped, you know. Yeah, but you've, it's 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 almost like a con. Mm -hmm. um, cons work because you want something, <laughs> and, and and the same thing here. You want something, and then you get something else. Yeah. And um, um, and I and, and and that's really seductive. What the I'm thinking about what happens after this moment and the kind of experience of of of. After that third bar, I mean, by the third bar, it's like you're not, you know, you're not going to get your G major, right? No, it's, um, it's not coming. But the question then, I always think as a listener, is like, is what could possibly happen next, right? Like, how is Schoenberg going to continue this? And I think that the what happens afterwards is also like really interesting and weird. Um, I don't know if you've got, I mean, this is sort of leading towards that chord, that though. chord, right? Yeah. Which is, and I'm trying to think about why, I'm also struck by that chord as being a kind of, I mean, I hate the word, it's not a climax, right? I mean, it, we always, no. music terms talk about something being a climax, but it's a kind of focal point in the piece or something. It's, a, it's, a, it's an event, right? That's a very good way of putting it, yeah. And it's, um, it's, the song can't go on without it. Mm -hmm. um, but it couldn't go any place but that chord is how it how it feels. Yeah. And, and that seems um really weird to think that that's been stated. That the chord makes sense. Um and, and I've been trying to can you figure out what chord that is? I mean, I have no I do have no idea how to uh -uh. describe what this chord. I mean, maybe the thing that I that I'm interested in in the way that it that it gets there. I I think um, there's, there's a kind of, um, I don't know, what would I call it? A kind of moment of, there's something hesitating or kind of tenuous in the next couple of bars. I, this is how, sometimes how I hear it, where, um, where Schoenberg returns to that, that, that little, the, the G and B, mm -hmm. right? But there's these other little elements that are sort of tossed in against it that seem to not really have much consequence, you know, like, um, in bar four, there's the C and the E flat. We kind of, you know, another third pops in. We're back on the G. In the next bar, there's that little rolled chord in the upper register. There's another third in the that where we were. Where the hands cross. The, yeah, where the yeah. hands cross. And then, uh, in that bar one, two, three, four, five, six, which starts to set up that big chord. Here, I feel like we like as the music after it's kind of hesitated for a while it somehow wants to it goes back to the well, it's, it's melodic like an idea. echo of that yeah. mm -hmm. but now it's somehow you know it's turned that single note melody line it's thickened it up with thirds mm -hmm. and it lands on this you know on a chord that only Schoenberg could write at that moment you know <laughs> yeah. this chord that is so I mean I, I think these chords are incredible they're beautiful rich well, amazing chords well, the restraint there it would have been um, really easy to make a sort of, sort of uh, noisy comment with a really dissident note mm -hmm. in there, but there isn't one, which is kind of um, what we're expecting, mm -hmm. and I think that's part of the surprise of it. Is it is, it is so um, well tonal. Yeah. <laughs> should we you, should we hear the next few bars? We'll listen yeah, to that. Yeah. And then so here's the picking up kind of from where we stopped. Um, it's hard to hear it. I mean, it, it probably actually needs the first three bars, but but I was I, that always sounds so tenuous to me. Like um, like as if it's there's a dis, something disorienting at that moment in those hmm. bars before that melody comes in. Um, I don't know if you hear it that way or if this is just Play, my own. Can you? Yeah, let's. I'm we'll, sorry. We'll do it. From you, <laughs> so okay. So we'll, let's go. Yeah. From, we'll go from the beginning. Okay. Okay.
That's a pretty cool chord too. Amazing, yeah. amazing. Yeah, there's the. I'm always wondering, like, um, the event of this big chord in measure six. Mm -hmm. I love the way that it gets. It's brought out in the Paul Jacobs performance. I love the way that it gets sort of snapped off by the return of that G and B. You know, like oh, you've yeah, got all yeah. that sustain, and then it's just like that little thing just clips it mm -hmm. off. And at that point, I mean, to my ears, that then we start to get these descending thirds in the bass, and it's it's as if that that material in measures uh, four and five, that stuff that's kind of tossed in, yeah. gets direction. It gets some kind of orientation, you know, like um, it the, reaches back to pull it in. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think that's right. And then it starts to descend its way down, and it has a kind of vector. It's moving in a certain way. Um, it arrives on a C and E, you know, which is, I mean, it could, this could be a C major chord, this could be four and G, this could be, maybe this is the tonic and G was the dominant chord the whole time. It's one of these this things is, where, This right? is helping me so much, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah, because I'm understanding it a lot better. But I love then at the end, once you've arrived there, you know, this seems like a moment where, where given this whole language, you're just like, there's no, what would be the, where, what could you do after that, right? It's arrived somewhere. And I love that Schoenberg returns to the G and then puts this, Incredible high register chord over it that yeah, with no bass at all, in it, in yeah. and you get these kind of stratification of like high, medium, and low. Well, right? to, to me, that that that's going to that whole idea of, of not giving any um, um, privilege to any any particular note. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, uh, There's when you were, you know, I mean, I'm thinking about. You mentioned that you had were listening to this piece a lot when you were painting. And this is right about the time, you know, when Schoenberg and Kandinsky are very close, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, and there's ways in which I think there are, I don't know, maybe there are painterly aspects of this music, you know? I think in the Jacobs performance, it's really brought out something like there are points against lines. There are planes of color, you know, that are like that chord is like a moment of repose or something. It's like a dark purple, <laughs> you know, a kind of blot there, you know. Well, yeah, uh, right about this time um, would have been when uh, this German named Feuerling, I think was his name, wrote a dissertation called um, Abstraction und Einfühlung, um, Abstraction and, and um, Empathy. Yeah. Um, yeah. And which became a manifesto for, for the abstract expressionist painters later on, but against the idea of the universal. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wonder if, if, if at all um, uh, Sch um, Schoenberg was informed by, by that. Because mm. I, I never, it was just right now that I, I thought of that. Yeah, I, interesting. I don't know. It's been a long time since I read Voringer. <laughs> I wonder if, should we, do we want to play this more and see where else we go, or should, are there other movements that we want to talk about? Well, we talked about the last one. Yeah. Um, and it was written um, kind of after the first five as a sort of um, tribute to um, Mahler. Yeah. And, and and it's really different. And maybe just to hear the, the difference. Sure. The, the, the so we don't have the score of the, si of the sixth movement, but that's fine, you know? Um, well, listen to that. This is, so this is, yeah, this is the famous, like the, the bells ringing or something like that. Yeah, kind yeah, of death yeah. knell for his, for his, for Mahler. Uh, all right, let's hear that.
so expressive. It's beautiful. I was. So what do you? Yeah. What do you? What are you hearing in it? Can I ask you that question? That's a terrible question to that ask. That is a terrible question to ask. Well, it's so sad. Um, um, but it's also... It, I get a sense of yearning out of it. Um, and I can't even say... Why? But it, 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 it feels like it doesn't end even though it feels like an ending. Mm -hmm. What do you get out of it? <laughs> I, I, can, I can feel those things from it. I think there is, it is elegiac and um, I think part of what's expressive about it is a kind of, well, often what's expressive in Schoenberg is a sort of weird detachment or something. You know, it's like the, it's, it's the, um, it's like the, how do you put it? It doesn't rely on any of the kind of conventional ways in which one would be expressive, right? Yeah. Um, it's, I mean, Adorno would often talk about this music as being, it's almost like it's, it's seismographic of somebody's psyche or something like that. So it's not laying out the kind of gestures of expression, like I'm angry, I'm sad, I'm <laughs> lamenting, but it's a kind of, but it puts together elements in the way that like, a psyche puts together elements, you know? It associates things and, and meanings emerge out of their juxtaposition. I kind of feel something like that in this, where that high chord, the first one that comes mm -hmm. in, the next one, I mean, they intersect in this beautiful way, but there's also like a gap between them. There's a kind of spacing between them. They're not played simultaneously. Well, and you're, you're describing exactly what I saw in this, because I see Rothko. Uh -huh. When I hear, okay. hear that piece, yeah, yeah, not in the others ever, but with that one, I I could I can imagine, yeah, yeah. the kind of blending of the weird the planes bl that blend and don't quite it, yeah. they're distinct, but but necessarily a part of of, uh -huh. of the other. Yeah, um, there's a way that I think the kind of uh, Schoenberg's ability to sort of put together um, elements that shouldn't quite go together, but somehow manage to go together, and they sit with a tension that the listener has to somehow reconcile. They have to figure out how to wrap their head around these things that are simultaneous and distinct and work together but shouldn't work together. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it opens up. It keeps opening up. And you know, it's kind of remarkable. It, um, nobody played Schoenberg's music in his lifetime, but here we are, 100 plus years after this was composed, mm -hmm. talking about it and, it and it still feels relevant. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, that's that's pretty remarkable. Mm -hmm. I still think this music is is in some sense. There's something unconsumable about it. You know, it's 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 never gonna just be. You're never gonna. It's never gonna be used it, to. It's sell not you. top forty. No, no. <laughs> no. Um, and it's and it's. I don't know. It's. Um, it's never going to become movie music. It's never going to become, you know. I mean, it has been yeah, used, right? I, I, I mean, but actually, I, I could. What, though, you mean atonality has become the standard <laughs> thing of a certain kind of movie music, but. Okay. Oh, that's no, right. Please. No, go ahead. Seven-note system. Uh, you see that this really stings. Uh, I mean, this, this, 
there, there's a, a deep sense of swing in, in lyricism. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and that, um, uh, that the, the very sensual core of this music So, love to, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Um, this is fascinating. And I learned a lot from you, especially about the expectations that you feel um, happen in, in, about tone. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if maybe this is what you were getting at, but one of the big questions I have is about time in this and the use of um, space and when the notes happen and when they don't happen. And um, in one, two, three, four, five, in the sixth um, bar, <clears throat> the uh, the quarter um, uh, note there with the with the C sharp, mm -hmm. I actually mm -hmm. found that the most surprising part of the of the whole piece, and I don't know why. I'm not a specialist, um, but there was something about the way that it was it was just so held before the. Uh, and I wonder if you could just talk, maybe if not that mm -hmm. that particular moment that struck me so much, but about the the time and when the notes happen and when they don't happen, because I, I found that all very surprising. Yeah. Well, even the the um, the instructions right there are uh, in good time. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I don't I don't know exactly what he means there, but um, um, I think there's a lot of um, I, this is this is a really temporally I think it's a really strange piece right because on one hand it seems like you've got this little repeated figure that should be somehow telling you where you are in the bar you know like a little you know um, little kind of rhythmic tattoo that's happening over and over and yet um, I mean Jacob's playing also kind of stretches it in different ways and everyone kind of pushes and pulls you know on it, but um, but it does. Even though it's kind of in strict time, it never feels like it's. I never hear a downbeat, you know, like that's clear. Like this is where one is. This is where and um, and even this little syncopated figure, you know, where you're talking about, it doesn't feel like a syncopation because you don't have any sense of orientation of where one is or two mm -hmm. is or three is or four is. But I love at this moment where, when the melody is now sort of when that melody from bar three is now being sort of repeated in a way here and with these thirds that are coloring it, you know, giving it a little bit more depth. The chromatic motion, you know, the fact that we go A flat to C to A to C sharp, I mean, this is like, you know, Wagner just boiled down to his essence or something like that. And it's got all that kind of like stirring of what chromaticism can do, you know? And it continues to ascend, you know, then you move up from A to C sharp to, you know, C to E flat. And then it actually drops down to D, right? So you get these kind of like da da di di kind of thing. Um, you know, it's this very kind of, it's a very classic, chromatic, romantic melody in a way mm -hmm. that has been, that it, where it's again giving you all of that like, you know, what's the, the kind of the schmerz and, you know, all that stuff, mm -hmm. right? But it's also been harmonized in such a way that, it, that it's, it, it, I don't know. It's a whole other world, you know. It, this this is also this is a moment like the moment where you're where I think at the beginning, you know, where you're given something tonal and it's being taken away, and you know this kind of double gesture. Mm -hmm. I think this is the same kind of thing where this is like now doing it with with Wagner or something like that. So I'm always struck by by this moment. Well, I'm I'm also from what this gentleman was saying, the the space in there is is um um. Is, is what, yeah. yeah, and it, um, it's what makes that chord even more. Um, uh, yeah. I was about to say unselling, but it makes it settling. Um, yeah. 
We also notice, I just know that Schoenberg is doing the kind of classic thing that, yeah, I love this, where, you know, there's a, uh, uh, there's a crescendo on that note, right? Yes. You mm -hmm. can't crescendo on a you can't crescendo a held note on a piano, right? <laughs> yeah, they automatically descend. So this is a kind of moment where the notation is pointing towards something that's not even sounding, right? Right. So as an interpreter, it's like how do you make that note grow? You know, that's a kind of nonsense, right? In the yeah, exactly I, I, what you're I, talking just, about. Yeah, exactly what I'm thinking as, as you say that. Um, Oh, there's a. Mm -hmm. I think because you mentioned power, special power. Uh, when I uh, heard the opening of six, it sounded like it, it sounded like a single tolled bell, uh, and then it ends in a very funereal mm -hmm. way. Yeah. 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 I, I, I think that's absolutely right, and it very it is really bell-like um, there, and. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's often talked about as being a kind of, you know, the, as a death knell or something. I mean, the piece was written on the day, on the day that Mahler died. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That's a good question because I... I, I, I Mm -hmm. I, I agree. That, that's why I, I, I always find myself saying apologetically, for lack of a better word, atonal, mm -hmm. um, which also makes me call into question when I say tonal. What is yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, certainly in dividing um, the ratios that we have are all arbitrary and, and don't work anyway. <laughs> yeah. But if you, I think, yeah, I, I, I would, I don't think the term atonal is without its use. I think that it, it, it looks like a kind of term of the negation of tonality, but the way that I sometimes think about what it does is that, um, Atonal music is not, it's not a negation of tonality. It always has tonality and the kind of feeling of repose and orientation in it. In a way, I think of tonality as being like perspective. It's something we learn, right? It's not a natural thing. It's a way of seeing, right? We learn to do it and we learn to hear tonal music because we're immersed in it all the time. And we can't ever fully get out of it. We wouldn't want to, I think, in some ways. And atonal music is a kind of puts perspective into perspective, one might say, right? It allows you to kind of have its, these moments of repose um, at the same time that you can, you can defamiliarize them. You can also explore the possibilities of what other kinds of moments of repose might be like, you know? So for me, there's something really, um, there's a kind of, uh, I don't know. I, think, I sometimes think of atonality as like skepticism in the sense that it like, you think you know how the world is, but it could be otherwise. And it's a glimpse of what that other world could be like, but it needs the world you know as a basis for it, right? There's no skepticism without the given or something like that. That's getting too philosophical. Well, can, I throw a spanner, yeah. can I throw a spanner in the gears? Yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> um, the, the, the whole idea of, of, of tonality hinges on tuning. Mm -hmm. Right and and you know before equal temperament there were maybe uh, there were 150 
different tuning methods. And so we've settled on this. And there's all sorts of music, even in Western music that we hear, that we're hearing differently from the way it was composed because the tunings mm -hmm. are now different. So that this I, I don't think this, this is uh, in, in any way in disagreement with what mm -hmm. you're saying, but, but there's something about that arbitrary um, uh, uh, capitulation to equal temperament that I find problematic. Uh -huh. um, yes? I'm wondering, um, if you heard this piece played live, did you play it too? And also, like, was that experience different? I know you described being on repeat on the recording. Mm -hmm. so Well, I'm not a, a pianist, but it's not a terribly difficult piece, and so I have plucked at it. I would not say that I can play it. <laughs> I, I, I go and I listen to that chord, and, I, and I'll try to, to play it. But um, we listen to um, different versions of it. You know, part of the, the, the difference between the Polini and the Jacobs is he's playing a better piano. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah. Um, but. Um, I didn't know that Glenn Gould had recorded this until um, Brian told me, so I went and listened to Gould's recording, and we had a discussion today about um, someone, make this, someone playing a weird song in a weird way, <laughs> and, um, and I, and what did we decide? I don't remember. I mean, I, th I think Gould's brilliant when he's playing Bach and Mozart and lots of other things, and he can yeah. make it weird, right? He can bring all these things out that you've never heard before. Um, I don't think he can do that with Schoenberg. It's like he no. does, there's not enough of a, there's not a kind of baseline for him to, to. Yeah, well, to he's, not, he's not bouncing against, off, he's not bouncing off something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I've, I have seen these played live. Um, I've seen a lot of Schoenberg's music played live. Mm. Um, I don't, I don't always remember what the live performances were like. Sometimes like, that's a, little, like, a lot of live performances for me. They're great when you're at them and then they, they somehow lose definition and you're just left with a kind of feeling of what they were. I don't always remember the details of people's live performances, but there are really tremendously amazing recordings of this piece. And it seems to, I mean, I'm not a pianist either, so I don't quite understand all the difficulties that are involved in it, but they're pretty radically different, the interpretations of the piece. And it makes mm -hmm. me uh, think that there's probably a lot of challenges that pianists have to face with a piece that looks so simple and easy in some ways. The question of how you, I think the issue of continuity, what connects with what, and how you draw out the idea of what connects with what is really yeah. important. I think wh where you emphasize things, how do you bring out motives? Does that make this music cohere? How coherent do you want it to be? When I, Even recognizing the motives is, is so hard. Yeah. yeah. When I listened to the Polini recording, which we thought we were going to play, and then this morning I was listening to these Jacobs recordings a lot, and I was like, oh, these are so much better, you know, maybe I'm, and then tomorrow I'll probably be like, Polini is so much better. <laughs> um, the Polini recordings feel kind of abstract to me in a way, like they focus more on the kind of color of the music, like, the, like all the, they resonate in a way, but the Jacobs is like this melody that runs through it. He makes everything... Yeah, at first linear, I, right? when I when I I I attributed that to um, Polini being not in a bad way, more tentative, mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure I'm right now as as you said that um, um, maybe it simply is is a, a, a delicacy there that that maybe belongs there. I yeah. Don't. I'm uh, I'm aware of our time. We're at five or three. We're supposed to be done at five. Yeah. So. Uh -oh. I mean, and a, lot of, as a lot can happen in three minutes, yeah. as we just learned from listening to Sherbert. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank Percival for thank all you. your brilliant novels, and lovely to talk with you about music. And, um, and I hope everyone sticks around and enjoys the rest of the events at the Wyndham Campbell Prizes.